Welcome to True Gay Crime Unearthed, a show where we discuss a podcast of true gay crime. What? Wait, what do you mean you don't know what true gay crime is? Wilma, they're saying they don't know what true gay crime is. Well, they can't be real gays then. Well, hello. Listen, I, I put a link in the description. Go to the description. There's a link. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Spotify, Google, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find True Gay Crime. You're going to go there now. You're going to go. You're going to subscribe. You're going to listen to episode one because there's only one. This isn't a big thing for you to do. Listen to episode one and then come back. Wilma and I will be here. We're going we're gonna to wait for you, right, Wilma? Yes. Okay. Well, well, I've got things to do, but I'll, I'll come back and chat. Come back fast. Listen fast. Listen and fast forward. Oh, you're back. Great. Okay. Now that you've listened to the episode, True Gay Crime, we're going to discuss Kevin Lee Graff. And today my guest is Wilma Fingerdew. Wilma. Hi, doll. Oh my God. I'm so excited you're here. Listen, Wilma is the host of the Fingerdew Review on YouTube. Now, if you don't know what that is, first of all, you're living under a rock. You're, you're an idiot. I'm sorry. She does the review and a recap of RuPaul's Drag Race, which obviously everyone watches. And it's, it's like a one-stop shop. Honestly, yeah. and it's not just the U.S. one, right? It's the Canadian one. You do Holland, all of UK. All of them. Did you do yeah. Holland? We're, we're on the cusp right now of, like, we just started All Star, I mean, sorry, Drag Race Season 13 in America. Yeah. Britain Season 2 is starting next week, so we'll have two different franchises running simultaneously. You're busy. And then after Season 13, All Star 6 is happening. But, okay, so let's talk about you out of drag, too. Yes. Because out of drag, you're Richard Ryder. And you're oh, oh, <laughs> hairy chested Richard Ryder and a host of um, Knock Knock Ghost on our TV, which I Googled, by the way, it look this is right up my alley. How do I how did I not know about this show? This is right up my alley. It's so it's and I love I love this part, too. It's three hosts, right? A, a comedian, a tech guru and a psychic walk yeah. into a bar. Like it sounds like um, the beginning of a joke. <laughs> but that's we what it says on the thing. Uh, my uh, initially, she was my assistant. Yeah, because she's comic relief. Like, let's like if we're looking at a structure of a TV show, she's right. the comic relief. So she's uh. always got she's the nervous one. She's always got like an opinion of what's about to happen, uh, and 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 it is a delight. Yeah. So for that first two seasons, she was like my personal assistant, and we had this running gag that started where you know she never brought me a coffee, and it was it just became very funny. And like when I when I read about this, I was like, you you are the perfect person for the first episode because of the, of you do the reviews with the drag drag and like true gay crime is kind of like that. And that's what this show is. It's like kind wow. of like a review slash recap of true gay crime. No. And no. you, you have the ghost thing, the crime thing, the angle and everything. So I didn't even know how perfect you were for this, but. Oh, it's so exciting. Yeah, no, I was, um, I was excited too. Cause you know, crime and murder are not big interests for me like personally like i don't go looking for that information yeah. but i have watched so many of those netflix shows as humans we like to gather we like to tell stories yeah. we like to hear stories and the, the thing with true crime is that they're real so that's what makes them so scary too well, and what was great about this first one was just you know you they always tell you try and personalize a story hmm. And then, you know, as you're saying stuff, like I remember when you said the first thing, it's like, oh, well, I live in that neighborhood. Like, well, lots of people live in a neighborhood. Calm down. Yeah. Uh, but then you said, and by the end of it, it was like, what? Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, okay. So let's talk about the episode. Let's, let's, let's get into it a little bit. So Kevin Lee Graff, what stood out for you in his story? I mean, what's, or, or what's the first thing you think of when you listen to the podcast? Was there something that stood out where you were like, Oh, shit. No, uh, because, I mean, the initial thought that the neighbor had of him as a child or younger or whatever, mm. uh, I think we hear lots of hindsight. Like, people said that about Jeffrey Dahmer. You know, yeah. there's a lot of people that are like that in life, and I don't think it stands out because there are so many. Mm -hmm. uh, what I think is odder is that we have this history of people where people have said, well, they were so docile or whatever and nothing was ever done like now it's like okay yeah that nice quiet guy down the street with the nice lawn somebody should look in his basement once just yeah, once totally just, have dig, up his, just to show up. <laughs> dig, up, dig up his backyard quick because uh yeah, run a few dogs through the backyard see what they yeah. smell you know, and we never do and you know hindsight right. yeah you talk about moments in that story where people could have 
actually seen some him walking by or down the street and not thought anything of it. Yeah. Because it's so out of context. And so like you look up, you look back. We notice 400 different things. Each person will notice something different about somebody. And it's, yeah. it's amazing how oblivious we can be socially. Yeah. And this is really more of a, of a, um, uh, a, a call to people to pay more attention. Yeah. You know? Well, it's, and to your point, it's, it's like, it, never mind strangers on the street. You know, you're minding your own business. You're in your own thoughts. You're in your own worlds. You're not looking for stuff like that necessarily. And never mind that, but just people are married to these people, you know? people are family members of these people or they grow up with them and they just don't and people say oh he's the last person i would have thought or oh he doesn't look like a killer okay but what does that look like well, what does a killer look like right yeah, like well there's no telltale signs until after and then you're like oh look you know but you know we're all raised with the idea of the boogeyman yeah as children so we think that the scary people do look scary or are nefarious and no. in fact most times it's the opposite and yeah. nobody talks about that. Yeah. You know. Did you see the um, the Ted Bundy Netflix? No. I mean, it, it, to this point, they were going on and on how good looking and charismatic and how even when they knew it was him and he was in, um, he was going through his trials and everything, like the people were coming to the court, believing him and defending him. And even the judge was like lenient on him. You know, in the in the in the sense that he complimented him at the end of the trial, it was like, "Hey, you would have made a great lawyer." You know, I'm sorry it turned out. I'm sorry it turned out this way. Like he ripped apart women, so I don't. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. It's yeah. You well, don't. You don't know. You don't know. And nowadays, I like to look at somebody like that and wonder, well, how articulate would he have come off to someone if he had not been white? Correct. Well, that's you know it. I mean? if, if he was black, the judge never would have said that. He would never have gotten to that point. He would have no. been probably murdered by by authorities. Correct. Allegedly, the way some people like that tend to get lost in the system. Of and course. It's yeah. horrible. That's the bigger crime, yes. Yeah. Let's pivot. I, I wanted to talk to you about um, the gay for pay angle. So he wasn't out of the closet, but he was do he considered himself gay for pay. And this is such a, a controversial, you know, everybody has their own sort of definition. What does that mean, gay for pay, right? So what what what's your when you hear that term and you see somebody or you hear a story about somebody like Kevin Lee Graff, who was saying that he was straight, but gave her pay. He was working as a go-go boy. He was an escort. So where does that fit for you? Well, I, I really, really like your statement because I've never quantified it this way before, but you saying you're not getting rich as a go-go boy. There's not enough. If you're on the fence yeah. sexually, then maybe you would consider testing the waters while you're getting paid you can you can rationalize that in right. your head if you're yeah. not even remotely on the fence if your spectrum is way over there yeah i i mean you know a million dollars would you put a penis in your mouth like would you take yeah. it up from your end like yeah where's that financial line some people that line would never come you know right. they would never cross that line but i i have to say for instance one of my favorite porn stars is chris yeah. rockway who is openly straight there are people i think out there that that do um have a sexual preference particularly but i have no problem sure working do you know what i mean and, mm, and like it's just I, physical well if you think of most sex workers yeah i don't think anyone would want to sleep with any of the people they sleep with for money exactly do you know what i mean we have yeah, this that's a great point ideal of richard gear climbing up uh, a fire escapes for everyone and it's not it's not the case yeah you know? no that's a great point because it's just yeah. physical so you're just I doing know, the I, think, I think you're either into sex anyway mm. or you don't care who you're sleeping with you just care who knows about it kevin lee graff was just an escort not just an escort but he was an escort and a go-go dancer like you know so there was no big name out there and yeah, he was at the lower realms the outer rim of the yeah the yeah Uber. Yeah. Yeah. No. And like, that's, that's where you start. I mean, there are some incredibly famous porn stars who started as a go So, yeah, you know, it's sure. certainly the, the, um, the gateway job. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, but you know, also, yeah. I think the idea of like, of making money mm. for sex, I, I'm so ashamed at society because when you think about it, the idea that a person, regardless of their sex, can be so attractive mm. to someone else yeah. that they're willing to pay 
Mm. Not just money, big money. Yeah. This privilege. And it's been poo-pooed on by puritanical, yeah. let's face it, un, 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 unsexually um, provocative women. You right. know, wives, ugly wives, let's just say it. I think through the ugly period housewives period, that haven't had it sex in years. Yeah. And because we've had uh, centuries of this headspace, we have this shame that perpetuates, yeah. um, you know, sex. And, and this is why we have problems with people coming out sexually or mm -hmm. whatever. And it, it, there's so much shame. And then we end up with these people committing crimes because there's been no help and their mind cracks you know and it's awful it's all well, awful and i think in centuries to come we'll look back at this time of it, we have this great intellect and this amassed ignorance all at the same time it's amazing yeah. it's like it's not just sex work too it's like being gay just being gay like this guy was from or like rural rural oregon where i'm sure it was not Edwin accepted oregon. yeah <laughs> Oregon, oregon Irrigan, Irrigan, <laughs> Oregon, like terrible name, but you know, I'm sure names. What do we call this? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. What, what rhymes with Oregon? Irrigan. <laughs> um, but like, I'm sure he suppressed, like he suppressed his homosexuality or, or any tendencies, you know, obviously he was pushing that down, pushing that down. And that with his obviously mental health issues, cause he was diagnosed schizophrenic, yeah. which, which uh, I'm finding I'm a lot of, a lot of them are. I have to say, yeah. I think a lot more people yeah. would be diagnosed schizophrenic, even mm. not showing any tendencies. Yeah. Because I think it's one of those things we just don't know enough about. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's easy to say you're schizophrenic because yeah. you're referring to one level of it, but it's like Asperger's or autism. Like, I think there are a lot of people that are going through life undiagnosed and, and not being, you know, maybe getting all of the necessary aid they need to go oh it's a puppy oh look at that say hi maluma that's oh. maluma oh blah 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 oh <laughs> hi baby she's cute um but so yeah cute. i think i think that it's um i think it's all avoidable i i, I think our hang up with sex yeah causes yeah so many issues well and, and this whole um focus that we have now on mental health and mental health issues and taking care of our mental health. That's all new. So, you know, in the past, it's if, you know, uh, if you look down upon for being gay and you've got mental health issues that are undiagnosed and untreated, and then, I mean, it's just spiraling down. And then you take drugs, like all of that compiled on top of each other. And then oops, suddenly you're a serial killer. So I think, I feel like now that we're addressing, you know, mental health issues and, gays becoming slowly more acceptable i mean we live in a bubble in toronto and in canada and you know in north america there's bubbles so we're lucky but you know slowly but surely yeah, it's, it's amazing if you don't travel yeah. globally uh and off the beaten path you get a very false sense of the world and what's right and what's wrong and yeah. you know not everyone thinks the way we think and not a majority of people in some places think the way we think and yeah. You know, it's a combination of uh, male privilege, white privilege, North American privilege, where we're like, I, how dare you? I'm calling my, do it. Call, who are you going to call? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Go In for two it. Minutes, you will be disappeared from the earth. Yeah. Who are you going to call? You know? <laughs> yeah. Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I wanted to say to you, I'm a, I, I love, I've been to San Diego. Yes. And I love San Diego. I've only been to, I don't even know where I was, what area I was, but um, uh, I really, I really love San Diego. But yeah. when people talk about LA, like mm. I don't have a sense of it because I've never been. And I realized that it's very spread out. There's really no neighbor, like there's neighborhoods, but no real, like you, you need a car. It's nothing's close. And if no. you're in this area and you're, you have to be over there, it's, it takes time and blah, blah, yeah. blah. So to hear you talk about Hollywood and uh -huh. Sunset Boulevard and, and Holly, uh, uh, um, uh, the streets and the studio and everything. I, I love that. Yeah. But, um, it amazed me because the idea that this guy randomly, like he randomly showed up at Mr. Lee's place. Right. Well, that that's, we know was it rent? Really, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But it strikes me as odd that it, two men, now they were kitty corner to each other by fences. Correct. And yeah. they were both older. Yep. Like, it, that seems not random. 
Like if one had been a woman and one had been a man, or one had been young and one younger, yeah, yeah. So that that all was very weird. Why that? Ha- like why that house? It's so random that it almost isn't. You know, it's like that's too specific. Yeah, and the fact that that poor Mr. Lee was having that day ahead of him. This is ridiculous. Like I can't even. Worse. Like it just. Yeah. It's just senseless and unnecessary oh. and like i don't know i'd like to think that if i were a potential murderer and i came upon a 90 year old person i'd be like oh you're close enough to death i'll go somewhere else you you're, know I mean? you're, you're like a thoughtful murderer you're like well, no, 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 you're you're old enough you're, you you made it this far i'm not gonna i don't know i think the rule should be if you could take him in a fight you can kill him. i used to work on a tv show called uh, forever night i did wardrobe on it oh i know and i've heard of that yeah it was a vampire cop show and a lot of our shoot shoots were done at night. Mm. We were in a studio mm. uh, in Toronto. Like it wasn't like we were out in the middle of nowhere or anything. But you know, back then, I would say this is about ten or fifteen years ago. You know, there wasn't the extensive public transit service we have now. And so sometimes we'd be finished shooting on like whatever night we were shooting, and we'd be done at like two in the morning, three in the morning. There were no buses going on. And so I drove a little uh, Honda Prelude two door yeah. uh, it had two seats in the back and another seat bucket seats up front and i would put as many of the girls the extras in that into my car yeah and drive them either to the subway or like in the direction i was going but i can get you to here i can get you to here i can get and i would get like four or five of them into my car and drive them because there was no nothing set up for them to like how do you not and the, and the, the, the production people. company didn't feel responsible for them or well, so many people drove do you know what I mean? And, and a lot of the time with extras, legally, the responsibility for extras on a film are minimal. Mm. They don't even legally have to feed them. But what, what happened after the fact, after I'd worked on that show, and I didn't know this at the time, but one of our regular extras on that show was Paul Bernardo. No. Like, like really? I wasn't, you know, like, there was no fear for my safety or my life around sure. Paul Bernardo because I wasn't yeah. part of what he was uh, doing, but... Um, he was an extra on the show? Yeah, yeah. It was very no. awkward. And after the fact, it was um, it was very creepy. You know, you sit there and you kind of go, oh. Well, you know, and, th- and that totally makes sense because so many of them, I'm discovering, are narcissists and they, they want fame. Like, they're, they're all about the fame. They want to be known. They want to be recognized. They want to be adored. They wa- so him being an extra, being an actor, trying that whole thing, I'm not surprised at all. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so let's go back to, let's talk about the, like, why Robert Lee's? Like, why did Kevin Lee Graff end up on Robert Lee's doorstep? Why why that? Because the worst Uh, thing about Robert Lee's death is he was getting ready for an award, like a a, a celebration of the work that he'd done through the McCarthy era in Hollywood. Like, this man... 91 two or three times before this do you know what i mean like the fact that he had was that tenacious yeah 91 years old and that this is how he he dies like i have to say on some level i'd have to be if i were a relative of of robert lee's i'd be like well he was tenacious they had to take him you know (laughs) 91 he wasn't going anytime soon yeah and had an 80 year old girlfriend who was keeping up with him he was clearly not on the way out. No, uh, no. So that's the biggest tragedy. But yeah. But it was that day, and then the neighbor on the phone with the oh, the uh, travel agency. Yeah. Like, Who, what in your trajectory of life? Yeah. Braces you as a travel agent to yeah. listen to something like that on the phone? Because you know, I mean, he knew something bad was going on because he called the LAPD. So it's like, you know, it's not, it's not, oh, it's not a domestic fight. It's not, he's not just yelling with his wife or something. Like, he knows something is terribly wrong. I also like, what does that, that sound you, like, I wonder, yeah, you know? If you're hearing that kind of fight, I, I'm assuming out of the gate, there's a lot of noise. Yeah. And then there isn't. Mm, and then yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because if you're, even if you're knocking somebody out to kill them, yeah, you want them to not fight you, I would assume. Yeah, and so apparently, from what you were saying, it, there was a lot of screaming and activity that the person could hear on the phone. Yeah, I'm assuming at some point it just stopped. And I'll bet you that that uh, Robert, uh, sorry, that uh, Graf didn't hang up the phone. Right, 
It could right. have just been sitting there listening to everything. Like, how yeah. horrible. Yeah. And the dog, then he kicks the dog. I mean. And then those poor people talking about watching his widow walk the one-eyed duck. It's just terrible. Yeah. But, but yeah. the fact that you met that person the day you're editing this story, like, what the hell? Had, I wanted to ask you, had you seen this woman in the park before with your dog? I had met her once before. And you did, you did have a passing. We Yes, yes. I met her once before. Of course, we didn't talk anything about this. And yeah, and it was in passing. Like everyone who owns a dog knows everybody in the park and stuff. Yeah. But But yeah. this particular day when I was editing the podcast, LA came up because she said, oh, yeah, she said, oh, it's really cold today. You know, it's I, I'm from L.A. But I was like, oh, I used to live in L.A. And then it just like devolved from there and just turned into yeah. this like crazy. What are the chances? And then she wasn't home because she was at a Madonna concert. And the, and then she comes home and there's blood on the fence. And like she was usually in the backyard at that time of day when he would have hopped the fence. I mean, I horrifying. She told me, oh, I actually ran into her again. Uh, was it a few days ago? Not even a week uh, ago from today. And she told me that she, since she spoke with me, it has reignited the imagery and the, the whole situation in her mind. And she's having trouble sleeping. <gasps> and, he, and when I saw her the one day, she told me I got up four times last night to check that the door was locked. Oh, how terrible. When she told me that she, she couldn't sleep and she was checking the door, I just thought, and she wasn't even home. And she's not even family of the victims. So anytime something like this happens, the friends, the family, they're changed for like, there's, there's before this happened and there's after this happened. And there's like this huge divide where they will never be the same. Right. Yeah. Right. No, it's true. Yeah. She was just a neighbor who wasn't even home and she's traumatized. So. The imagination is a powerful thing to begin with. But if you're put up against a situation where it's like, Oh, you were this close to like, and then your mind mm. starts to go and think, oh, you could, you could do yourself some serious damage for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fascinating to see, like, you know, you hear of a murder and you're like, oh, that was awful. But at the same time or during the same years that this person is doing their murders, there are other people out there also doing their murders. Yeah. Because when I'm watching the net Netflix shows, there's like Ripper, there's all of these shows and they're the timeline, the years are similar. They're, they all fall within a certain time, like different geography in the country, but these are happening simultaneously. Right. And that's yeah. just one country. Yeah. Like it's, it's just, there's so much murder. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's, really common. it's sad that it's common. Right. When I was a kid, my parents wanted to move to the country and I was all like, okay, bye. <laughs> Yeah. But now I would, especially with the internet the way it is and knowing that I could live in the country and not be completely cut off from society, I yeah. would do it. Now. I would live in the middle of the country. I would raise my own crops if I could. You know? I hear what you're saying. I think for me, it's also a, a, it's a thing for me, it's a thing of, of getting older. Now that I'm a little bit older, I don't need to be right in the middle of everything. Like I want a little bit of space. So, yeah. you know. For not just because I'm going to get murdered by somebody, but just, you know, I'm a little bit older. I, I want a little bit of quiet. I want a little bit of space. You well, know I mean? I mean, I'm a little more selfish. I'm lippy. Yeah. I'm going to tell you off if you piss me off. And yeah. chances are I'm going to get shot. <laughs> don't stand in front of that club down the street, please. No, I don't. I'm too old for clubs now. Yeah. I remember um, a friend of mine once, I saw her in my neighborhood at a bus stop waiting to go. I guess she was going home from wherever she was and I just happened to see her and I, I said uh, hey pretty lady as I was walking up to the bus stop and she <gasps> like shut down turned around got into the small I, I was like and I said her name and she turned yeah and I said oh my god I'm so sorry like it never struck me as a white male yeah and you're big too what do I like you're, to be you're tall about? I'm six four yeah yeah, I'm you're, you're, yeah you're imposing yeah I'm not afraid of much like I'm nervous but mm. You know, I know people really, really want to come at me if they're coming at me. And if they really yeah. want to, well, you know, I'm not giving them a fight. You, oh, you're not? Okay. No, no, I'm not that person. I thought you were going to throw yeah. down. Okay. No, I've thrown two punches in my life and I really hurt both people and I'm okay with not doing I've that. Never, I've never punched anybody. No, and I, I only punched these two people like as a defensive thing. Oh. And one of them, I hit in the solo plexus 
and they went down and couldn't breathe and i thought i killed them like <laughs> oh that must have been a terrible <laughs> feeling too like i just i would do it in defense 100 percent. like if it's defense if you're coming at me and i have no choice i i will defend myself but i would never throw the first punch ever you could say oh, the no. horrible things to me and behave just completely inappropriately and whatever i will just walk away because i'm just i'm always fascinated by cultures like like Britain, for instance, where it just seems anyone in a pub is ready to fight. Yeah. When I'm on the road as a comic, uh, maybe we'll drink at the hotel after, you know, um, yeah. and that's fine. But I don't like to be out of control of myself and, and unfamiliar with my surroundings. You know, yeah. it just I think that that can just ask for trouble. You know? Always, always. If yeah. anything bad ever happens, there's always drugs and alcohol involved somewhere for somewhere. sure. For no. sure. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, that's the other thing with someone like uh, uh, Mr. Graff was being undiagnosed as mm. or untre untreated as, as bipolar or schizophrenic or whatever range of things he was dealing with. Uh, drugs aren't helping that. Oh my God, no. You know, and especially like any drug that might have felt like it was helping out of the gate or put him into a better headspace for whatever he was taking it for would have been fine for him that first or two times. Yeah. But you can't, you can't, nobody can do that kind of abuse, especially with chemicals and expect to stay even keeled. I remember in my meth days, I was in Los Angeles and like so many people I met would just had gone off the deep end and I was heading in that direction too. But I, I, I don't, luckily I don't have the same, I, I guess that my starting place was different than their starting place. Yeah. And then you add drugs on top of that. And then, you know, it escalates and gets to a certain place. And, yeah. and I just met people that went completely, they got super paranoid. You know, everyone was out to get them. They lost everything They they were just on the street. Like they just... Yeah, it changed. It just, if you're already not, if you just have a switch, you know, already, if, and if that switch is easily clicked, then the drugs, especially meth, like if we're talking about crystal meth, forget it. Like I used to do um, acid in the 80s. Oh, how retro. Yeah. And I loved it. I would save up my money. I would buy one hit of acid for Saturday night. And I was at that one club on acid until the subway opened and I go home. And yeah. You know, and that was it. I didn't drink. I, you know, but I remember, I remember like I was sitting in an alley outside this club and these kids were trying to break in. They wouldn't let you into the voodoo lounge in Toronto with cat jeans on. And it was only because it meant that you weren't from downtown. It meant that you were from a suburb and oh. you could possibly be causing trouble. Okay. And so these two boys shimmied up the building onto the fire escape, which oh. I was kind of sitting under. So I moved over just jokingly. I said, I don't need anyone falling on me. And then one of them did and died. <gasps> yeah, like right there, boom, next to me. It was like, oh, <laughs> like, terrible. Ah, you terrible. almost landed on me. Careful now. I wasn't upset. I don't remember being upset, but I had to tell the cops yeah. what I saw, which wasn't much. And I just didn't want to come off as crazy or high. For the life you had. I really enjoyed how normal you were. I always enjoyed talking to you uh, whenever we did chat in like reception or something, because yeah. you just, you just, you know, sure you'd had this life, yeah. but it wasn't who you were. It wasn't the only, you know, and, and I find also you have conversation skills. Like when you talk to people, you're, you listen, you respond. Like mm. you know, a lot of people with a past that's very colorful, so mm -hmm. to speak, tend to still be very yeah. egotistical, and very yeah. self-centered, you know, I, 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 think, I find that the hardest thing. I appreciate that. I think the thing that for me is like, I'm very, okay, check. Like I did that. Like, okay, check next. What, 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 because I'm so hungry for, for life okay. and for experiences. And I'm so curious about new things and turning the page and next chapter. So for me, leaving something behind is, is kind of, um, like nostalgic but it's almost expected because it's like a chapter that's my chapter of that boop next so i think there's no it doesn't i don't live there i guess is what i'm saying you know well i'm super glad you're starting um not just this podcast but also spilling it into um uh, a youtube channel uh and and all of that because like this is the time for it for sure but also yeah. 
you don't have a lot of gay content that isn't drag race related. And, mm. you know, I say this as one of those drag race related content. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's hard to uh, break out of the mold that we as the gay community, the LGBTQA a, a community um, have created for ourselves. Like, I, I remember when trans issues were starting to come to the forefront, I said, yeah. well, this is the new frontier. Yeah. Gays have always been that gray area no one knew how to deal with. And within that group, the bisexuals got a hard rap. Mm. But then trans people came along. Now we have asexual people or ace as they refer to themselves. You know, you can be asexual but have he heteronormative inclinations. Like maybe you like to snuggle with someone of the opposite sex. Oh. Or you can be asexual and like to snuggle with somebody of the same sex. Or Course. You are asexual, but you can't have sex with somebody unless you really know them and trust them. You know, mm. there's a, a very broad wow. spectrum. And I think we all fall into those categories to a type of degree, mm. but it just seems to be amplified to, uh, for me, an unfathomable level. Yeah. No one's asking you to be asexual. Yep, no one's asking you to be trans. Yep. Uh, but they're asking you to acknowledge that there are people that are. And here's... Mm what they're about and how best to go about your life when presented by them. <laughs> That's, it's like, you know, you're right. We need, and everybody that comes out and they have a show, they have a podcast or they have a YouTube channel, the representation is needed because even people within the community, like you and me, like, I didn't know there was, I didn't even know there was a flag. I know. I, I couldn't tell you what the flag looks like, you know? Well, so I on Drag Race UK season two. Yeah they used as their inspiration for their promotion the ace uh, sorry the progressive pride flag have you heard of this is it the one with the brown and the black stripes yes. the, the, the chevron yes. yeah and, yeah that uh, one i know and it and it has the trans colors yeah yes yeah. and so they used that flag for that yeah. uh and i'd never heard of that flag but when i saw it i realized oh i had seen it but i had no idea that there was a name and yeah. i talked about it in my podcast I mean, my, my YouTube channel, somebody who knew David, the designer for that flag, uh -huh. called him <gasps> and said, oh, you have to see this video. This queen's talking about you. Yeah. And then he sent me a message on YouTube, said, oh, thanks for the shout out. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, wow. finger do. And I felt horrible. Well, you're a star, finger do. Uh, you're a star. <laughs> I'm hobnobbing with the cranks. Oh my God. Rubbing shoulders with murderers and flag designers. Wilma Fingerdo, thank you so much for being my first guest. Me. True gay crime unearthed. It's a crime that I missed. Beautiful. Oh my God. Lock her up. She's too gorgeous. And remember, folks, always look behind you, lock your doors, tell someone where you're going, and look out for each other. Why can't we all just get along? Seriously.